Good morning. Uh, I'm Kelly Ayotte, Senator from New Hampshire. I'm really honored to be here uh, today uh, with, first of all, my colleagues, Senator Roger Wicker from Mississippi and Senator Lindsey Graham from South Carolina. And most of all, I want to thank all of our uh, veterans groups who are here today and those who have sacrificed so much from our country, for our country. Uh, we have a large number of groups who are represented here today at this press conference. And so I would like to uh, if, uh, name those. And we may have missed a few last minute additions, because obviously this is of deep concern to all of our veterans. But I would like to thank those from the American Legion, the American Logistics Association, the American Veterans, the Associate, Association of the United States Navy, Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, the Marine Corps League, the Marine Corps Reserve Association, the Military Officers Association of America, the National Defense Committee, the National Military Family Association, the National Association for Uniformed Services, the National Guard Association of the United States, the Retired Enlisted Association, the Veterans of Foreign, uh, foreign Wars, and the United States Army Warrant Officers Association. Of course, the 33 organizations that make up the military uh, coalition have written every single uh, member of Congress to express their dismay and concern about a very troubling provision that is in the budget. And I think this provision in the budget is absolutely wrong because budgets are about priorities. And the budget that we are about to go vote on in the United States Senate contains a provision that singles out our mil military retirees uh, for cuts now. It's $6 billion over 10 years within this budget agreement. I certainly appreciate the hard work uh, that went into this agreement, but it is absolutely wrong to take from our military retirees those who have sacrificed the most to take it from their backs to pay for this budget agreement, particularly when we know that we can find these savings elsewhere. In fact, I filed two amendments yesterday that would find billions and billions of dollars that could easily address uh, these savings instead. Here's what this does. You see the chart over here. You have a sergeant first class loses almost $72,000 uh, before the age of 62 under the provisions that are in this budget agreement. And you think about it, why are we singling out those who have sacrificed the most for our country? Uh, a veteran, right now, there are men and women fighting for us in Afghanistan. Many of them have done multiple tours. Some did tours not only in Afghanistan and in Iraq, uh, they could be 19 years in, and now we're sending the message to them that when you retire, you will receive less because we will reduce your cost of living increase. Yet, when you look at the other changes that are made in this budget, for example, there is an increase in the contributions that federal employees have to make, but all current federal employees are grandfathered. It only applies to new hires. That's why I say it is unfair to single out our men and women in uniform who have sacrificed the most for our country. One of the most appalling parts of this is that we have now learned that this provision will also apply to those who have received a disability retirement. In other words, the $6 billion that CBO has calculated to pay for this budget, 10% of it CBO calculated coming from those who have received a disability retirement. Think about it. Someone has been injured in Afghanistan, one of our men and women in uniform. We've all been to Walter Reed. They've received a disability retirement. And what happens? Here's our thanks to you. We're going to cut your cost of living increase. And I've had some people say to me, well, this is working age veterans, so they can go out and get another job. Give me a break. First of all, our veterans earned this. They earned this retirement that they receive. But think about those who are disabled and their ability to go out and earn with another job. 
And what does this say about the priorities of the United States of America? This is very simple. We are here because we think this can be fixed, and it should be fixed. Uh, I have filed two pay-fors this morning, or yesterday, that can fix it. I know that within the trillions we're going to spend over the next decade, that we can find $6 billion rather than taking it out the backs of our men and women in uniform. So I'm very, very proud today to stand with this coalition. And I would like to introduce uh, my colleague, Senator Roger Wicker, and thank him for his leadership on this issue. Roger was the first to come forward and say to all of us in the Senate, this is wrong to bring this to our attention. And I want to thank Roger for his incredible leadership on this issue. Thank you, Senator Ayotte. Appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, thank you for the member organizations that are here and uh, lending support for this effort. Uh, it's, a, it's a late hour effort, but the votes haven't been cast on the Senate floor. And that still, that gives us, even now, a, a chance to be successful and persuade 41 of our colleagues to take a time out to get this right and, uh, and rethink this very harmful provision. Senator Ayotte is right. Our, our retired veterans have earned this. But not only that, they had a deal with the federal government. They had a deal with Uncle Sam, and they've already kept their part of the bargain. After that deal has been cut and one side has done everything he or she promised to do, then the federal government in the form of the Congress of the United States and a presidential signature says, well, we've just changed our mind. We need to save $6 billion over 10 years, and guess what? We're going to take it out of your hide. There's a reason for a COLA. It's a cost of living adjustment. The military retiree earns his pension, and we want to make sure that pension buys as much in 2016 as it bought in 2015. And that's the simple reason for the cost of living adjustment. What this legislation says to retired veterans, and as Senator Ayotte points out, to retired disabled veterans, regrettably, is we're not going to keep you up with inflation until you get to the age of 62. Now, this chart here demonstrates how that's seemingly innocuous COLA less 1% affects in real terms the uh, typical sergeant first class with 20, 20 years of service, $71,956 in, in lost income lifetime to that person who stepped forward, probably went overseas three times, volunteered to put himself in harm's way, kept his end of the bargain and is now having that deal reneged upon here by the Congress of the United States. Last year, Congress established the Military Compensation and Retirement Modernization Commission and asked the commission to look into this sort of question. It might be we need to make different calculations going forward. The purpose of the commission was to provide us with a comprehensive list of alternatives. But we specifically told the commission, House and Senate told the commission that it could recommend any option as long as it grandfathered in those who currently serve and those who are currently retired. Only fair to grandfather in the people who have already kept their end of the bargain. We did so with federal employees in this budget. Changed their retirement contribution a bit, but it applies only to those who entered the federal service after the first of the year. Somehow, it's supposed to be okay to treat military retirees differently from other federal retirees. Why is that okay? Why, of all people, would we penalize and treat differently the brave men and women who've stepped forward chosen a military career, and kept their end of the bargain. Senator Lindsey Graham. Thank you. Yeah. 
Well done. The truth of the matter is we're probably going to lose uh, this fight, but we will win this war. We're probably going to lose the vote today, and this budget's probably going to pass because everybody's hell-bent to get out of town and not shut down the government. Nobody wants to shut down the government. Here's the question. Is it this choice between keeping the government open and screwing all the military retirees? Is that the right choice? How about doing both? How about protect the veteran and the military retiree and keep the government open? If we wanted to, we got to January the 15th. If you put 10 people in a room, we could solve this in about two hours. No, we're in a big hurry around here to show you how functional we are. Even when we're functional, we're dysfunctional. <laughs> <laughs> we told the commission to make sure you don't do anything with uh, veterans or retirement benefits uh, unless you grandfather them. I guess we forgot to tell ourselves. Why would we tell somebody else not to do that and turn around and do it ourselves? Because people around here are in too big a hurry. You know, it takes 20 years to get these benefits. That's a long time. The prime of your life. If you're 42 years old, you know how much you make? If, I don't know, sir. I don't do Army. They'd be a Master Sergeant in the Air Force. E7. Sergeant First Class. Sergeant First Class. That's the Army. So I'm an Air Force guy. The rank is E7, right? Yes, sir. Okay, that's a good retirement. E7 means you're in the top three. Job well done. Uh, you know how much the retirement package is for an E7 who spent 20 years, whose children have probably been to five different schools, who've been to Afghanistan and Iraq more times you can probably count since 9-11? It's between twenty four dollars and $25,000. Well-earned, hard-earned, why do they have a second job? You go live on $24,000, $25,000 if you've got four kids or two kids or one kid, and there are four of you. Now, what does this mean? Between 42, the date of retirement, let's just say you retire at 42, and 62, when this thing ends, is $71,956 in lost retirement income through the COLA reduction. That's almost three years of retirement pay given back. In that 20 year period, you're really losing three years. Name one group in this budget deal that is anywhere near this. Of all the people we could have picked on to screw, how could we arrived here? How could we have done this? Seems to me that the average American would want to put these folks last, not first. I tell you how it happens. You get in a hurry, and we're losing, we're insensitive as a Congress and, quite frankly, a country. Only 1% of us serve. Nobody's all in like in World War II. And I cannot find the person who will step up and say, I did this. I called Chuck Hagel. He said, we didn't do this. We're going to find out who suggested this. And to the people behind me, there will come a day when we'll have to reform military pay and benefits. It is 56% of the DOD's budget. We're going to have to make some hard decisions to keep from becoming Greece as a nation. You know how you calculate the military COLA? Exactly the same way you do Social Security. What would happen if this budget had COLA minus 1% for Social Security retirees? Every Democrat and a lot of Republicans would be up here burning down the place. You got three of us. This is what happens when you have an all-volunteer service. You don't have a pack. You're not a contractor. A lot of contractors are doing high fives and celebrating. Well, we restore $20 billion of money taken out of the DOD's budget for two years. That's a good thing because we really do need to spend more money on our military because sequestration is killing it. But really, do you need to help the contractor on the backs of the retiree? So how does this happen? There is no organized group other than the veterans associations behind me to really weigh in. And you do a good job, but you're isolated. You don't have a lot of money to give. You probably don't give any money. 
You just have your shoe leather and your experience and your voice and your members. So when 1% of the population who has served so hard, fought so long, and sacrificed so much winds up in this boat, it tells me that Congress has forgotten what our primary job is to defend this nation. And you don't defend this nation through the CBO or the OMB or the Budget Committee. You defend this nation through fellow citizens who will make a career of doing and going wherever it takes and to stay as long as it takes. We're going to probably lose this week, but I promise everybody here we're going to win over time. Not only are we going to right this wrong, we're going to remind people who you are. And any politician who wants to do this again is going to get the hell kicked out of them. Thank you. I would now like to introduce uh, Vice Admiral, retired Nor Bryan, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the Military Officers Association. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator, and I'm honored to be here with my colleagues here today. Uh, the Military Officers Association of America wants to make it clear that we're not against the Budget Control Act, but we are against doing it on the backs of our military and their families. After all, uh, as our senators have reminded us for the tw last 12 years of war, uh, we've lost over 5,000 men and women killed in the line of duty. Uh, we've had 2.4 million uh, deploy overseas. We have had a quarter of a million come down with, with at least post-traumatic stress, 50,000 with traumatic brain injury. We now currently have 600,000 of our men and women that have served in Afghanistan and Iraq who are now retired. So. Our men and women have already paid a heavy burden. And what we're asking is that going forward, uh, we remember uh, that this is not just about money. This is about keeping our word, a principle, uh, which is very, very important. For the last 12 years, it has been the Congress that has kept the old volunteer force from going in a ditch as both Republican and Dem Democratic administrations in the Pentagon have had a very narrow horizon on people. And it has been the Congress that has done every improvement, whether it's Guard and Reserve health care, getting the payback to equivalency, or the new GI Bill, or looking after our widows and our veterans. The Congress has done it. But now we come to a point where, as Senator Graham has said, and the others have said, uh, they've rushed and they've made a very, very bad decision. Not only because it has a huge impact on dollars, but for military personnel and their families, the biggest impact is going to be in not keeping their word, keeping the principle that they will honor their commitments to these that have paid uh, such a heavy, heavy price. And so I simply want to say that the biggest impact, if we do not draw a line in the sand on this issue, is going to be the long-term consequences uh, to retention of the all-volunteer force. Because of the Congress for the last 12 years, we have kept the all-volunteer force going ahead. But frankly, the Pentagon has not spoken up on this issue. And frankly, they have not told the truth about costs. Uh, the Military Officers Association has put out a pamphlet that said in 1980, 1980, personnel and health care costs were one-third of the budget, one-third of the budget. In 2012, Military personnel and health care was one-third of the budget. So all these predictions coming out of the civilians and uniformed personnel in the Pentagon are wildly inaccurate. And we have got to get other folks challenging it, like Senator Ayotte, Senator Wicker, and Senator Graham are doing. They understand this is about principle. This is about protecting the all-volunteer force and keeping our sacred commitment to these men and women. And so we want to thank all of you uh, for your leadership and your vision in speaking out on this issue today. It is awfully, awfully important to the future of the all-volunteer force. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to now introduce Ray Kelly, the director of the National Legislative Service for the Veterans of Foreign Wars.
First, I want to thank Senator Ayotte, Senator Wicker, and Senator Graham for, for taking the hard path. The easy path would have been outrage, voting no, but in the back of their minds knowing that this was going to pass and leave a breach of faith for those who've retired. They've taken the hard road. They are looking for solutions. We need to join them in those solutions, find a solution to replace this provision, not shut down the government, not uh, continue sequestration, but find a simple solution. As uh, Senator Graham said, two hours. Put some heads together, this could be solved. So thank you very much for that. This is a direct tax on our military retirees and those who are in uh, active duty now looking to retire. After willingly standing in the gap to protect us from those who want to do us harm, after spending 12 years in war, multiple, multiple deployments to combat zones, moving every three years, spouses who can't hope to have a career because of how many times they've moved, Congress is now asking them to give more. This is unacceptable. The only battles our military cannot fight are the ones here on Capitol Hill, and that's why we stand here today. To give a voice to that 2.3 million members of, the, of our military National Guard and Reserve, and to the 2 million retirees, half of whom would be directly affected starting in 2015 by this tax. COLA minus 1% doesn't seem like much at first glance. The first month it'd be $15. So people put that in their mind, thinking, oh, $15 a month, that's not much to give. But as they explained, as the chart shows, thousands upon thousands of dollars that they would be giving back to the government to help end sequestration. The VFW doesn't want the government to shut down. We know it needs to curb spending. We know it needs to balance the budget and put an end to sequestration. But penalizing our veterans is not the solution. This sends a clear message to our NCOs and officers who are serving today that their sacrifice over the past 12 years was not enough and that our government is going to ask more for them, more sacrifice in the future. We have to protect our all-volunteer force. This flies in the face of that. The commitment, the dedication that our service members have given deserve only that. So thank you again. Thank you on behalf of the VFW for standing up for us. And uh, we are here to work with you through this, through this week, through the next year, for as long as it takes. So thank you very much. Thank you. Finally, I would like to introduce Tom Tarantino from the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America. Good morning. Um, I had something prepared, but I'm not going to use it because I'm, I'm frustrated. I'm frustrated that I'm actually standing here again to have to defend the care and services for the 1% of Americans who have fought for the last 12 years, who defend this country. I, it is unbelievable to me that we have to continue to have this conversation. I think this is the fifth time I've had a similar press conference and stood in rooms like this this year. You know, when, when this budget deal was announced, they spent a lot of time talking about all the things that weren't on the table, things that were sacred to both sides that they weren't going to discuss so they can come up with a compromise. I was shocked that apparently veterans and military families are on that table, that part of the discussion of how we're going to balance the budget is on the backs of the people who have sacrificed the most. And over the last five years, I've stood with Democrats, Republicans, and the White House to help fix the languishing care and services for veterans and military families that have been so dire need of reform. And I keep hearing in those meetings that if you want to know what your values are, look at what you budget for. Well, I guess now we know. Now that the war in Iraq is over and the war in Afghanistan is winding down and the American people aren't paying attention, the spotlight's off that small 1% who have borne all of the brunt of this war. We now know where the values really are. So we have to call on members of Congress to find the steel in their spine and retool their values. I, I am grateful for the leadership of Senators Ayotte, Wicker, and Graham to stand here. Three years ago, this would have been a two-hour press conference. There would have been 15 senators here. But these are the only three who have the courage to stand up today. 
And we need a lot more to stand with them and stand with us. Because in the end, veterans, military families, we're the only people who can stand up for us because apparently we don't have a Congress right now that is willing to do so. So we call on the Senate today to vote no and to fix this and not to balance the budget on the backs of the people who have sacrificed the most. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, we'll all take questions now. And can I just add, we've been trying to get confirmation all morning from DOD on a question that I don't think that they wanted to answer. And that was the thing that I mentioned when I came in here, which is about those who receive a disability retirement. And unfortunately, bad breaking news. They confirmed what we already figured out, that the COLA reduction under this uh, plan will impact those service members who are medically retired under Chapter 61. It's appalling. So can we take your questions? Yes. Well, here's the plan. Um, I, I think what's, what Senator Graham said this is absolutely right. I didn't spend much time yesterday, and I came up with two pay-fors already. Uh, this, is, this could be fixed. And we owe it to our men and women and uniform, and especially those who have been disabled fighting for us. We better fix this. So we're not going to let this go. I mean, there's this discussion out there that the Armed Services Committee is going to review this. So I appreciate that. But there needs to be more than review done here. Congress says they're going to review things all the time. That's not what we're going to fight for. We're going to fight for it to get fixed, not to just give uh, some good words to this. But a word of caution on that. Um, if the Senate gets the 60 votes, we'll proceed to 30 hours of debate. Um, the bill will pass with 51 votes or more, go to the president, he will sign it. And I think uh, people in this room know that changing a federal statute is pretty hard to do. So I haven't given up. Um, I'm going to, I guess the bell's going to ring in a few moments. I'm going to be reminding my colleagues uh, on the floor as I go over there, that, that the best way, the surest way to take a time out and fix this is to vote no. Okay. And if uh, the, the um, cloture passes, we'll have 30 hours of, of uh, some time to work with the leadership, to work with our colleagues, and to say, even now, give us an opportunity to pass the AOT amendment that, that fixes this and pays for it, or other amendments. Uh, th there is a parliamentary method to do this. But as Senator Graham says, we're in a mighty big Christmas hurry all of a sudden. And uh, it seems that maybe um, the sound of the voices b uh, behind me uh, is not being heard. But there's yet a chance. And the reason I'd like to push it this week is it's mighty hard to change a statute once it gets on the books. And if I could, yes. Uh, I'll tell you, the plan is to unleash the forces of hell, <laughs> to make sure that we run TV commercials if necessary. Somebody out there ought to help y'all raise some bucks. The average American would throw up if they knew this was really what was happening. I've talked to people who, CEOs and the doorman. I have not found one person who thought, hey, this is a good idea to retroactively cut colas for the military and you don't do it to anybody else. Right. And the budget deal doesn't take us off the path to becoming Greece. I appreciate bipartisan compromise, but it's got to make some sense. There's one person we're leaving out, the commander in chief. What can you do? Go to the White House. Ask to meet with the president before he signs the bill. You know, we're here as members of the Armed Services Committee. We have a role in the legislative process but President Obama, don't sign this bill in its current form. We've got to January 15th. You, above everybody here, 
has a responsibility to take care of those who serve, who are retired, who are going to retire soon and in the future. You are the commander in chief. Mr. President, do not let this happen. You could convene a group of senators and congressmen to come down to the Oval Office, sit in a room in the White House, and say, you're not leaving here till we get this fixed. Mr. President, do that. The American people will appreciate it. It would be a uh, great act of leadership by the Commander-in-Chief. And how hard would it be to fix this? In a $3.4 trillion, somewhere in that neighborhood budget annually, we're talking about a 10-year, $6 billion fix. Mr. President, if we can't, if Roger can't, and I can, and Kelly can't convince the Senate to slow down, you got to January the 15th. Get this fixed, because Roger's absolutely right. Once it gets into law, it's going to be hard. But you know what's really going to be hard? To justify keeping it in law. You're going to have a lot of explaining to do if you want to keep this thing in place. But the next point that we can bring about change is the president himself. Mr. President, show leadership as our commander-in-chief, refuse to sign this law as written, get us in a room to fix it by January the 15th. Back row. Uh, on the disabled veterans issue, I think there's been a confusion. So um, disabled veterans obviously can get benefits through the VA, but they're also entitled to a retirement from the Department of Defense. And so I think that unfortunately, some people are trying to confuse the issue and how they answer it so that you didn't think it applied to disabled veterans because there's a distinction. But make no mistake, we just got the confirmation that CBO... 10% of this money comes from $600 million, comes from disabled veterans to get to the $6 billion number. And not only that, but OSD just confirmed for us that if you received a disability retirement, you get the cut to the COLA as well. And think about that in terms of those who have sacrificed so much. And unfortunately, um, we've too many who have been disabled as a result of their service, most recently in Afghanistan and Iraq. So. We had, I can tell you, a much harder time than I should have had confirming this because people didn't want to admit, but it's in there. Could I add something to that? Yes, please. Leo and uh, Austin, both of you, I think you got to a point that the senators are trying to make that this was a very, very bad decision because it was made in haste. And we all know from the Constitution, this is the group that is the more deliberate group that is supposed to make the good decisions. And so, Really, we're calling, all of us in, in the uh, association world are calling on the Senate to do, do deliberation. And with 60,000 troops in Afghanistan and their families back here by themselves, I don't think it's too much for the Senate to send a signal to the House that they made a bad decision and they need to come back here and fix it rather than give uh, these men and women a bucket of coal for Christmas. <coughs> Any other questions? Thank you all, Thank Thank you you all for being much. here. Thank you.